The music of our guest this morning is heard all over the world on radio. It's used on television, film, soundtracks, and commercials. He has sold over 100 million records and has been awarded 23 gold singles, nine gold and platinum albums. And we are certainly very, very fortunate to have Tommy James as our guest this morning. How are you? It's it's fun to have you on the show this morning. Well, thank you so much. Nice to talk with you. We're more than excited to talk about your new book. John and I have both read it mm. from cover to cover, and I've been seeing online where a lot of people have been making the same positive comments that we've been making, and we'll start by explaining to everyone that you're also one of us as a Michigander and tell That's everyone right. about your West Michigan roots. That's right. Well, I was brought up and uh, consider my hometown not. Niles, Michigan. Uh, I've actually been up through Muskegon many times. Yeah, you played up here a few times, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, I uh, uh, I love it back there. Uh, my home. I have a home in Michigan. You know, all my. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all because many of them have passed on, but a lot right. of my friends who uh, I went to school with, and uh, you know, I, I love coming home and, and visiting. We're going to kind of uh, walk down memory lane with you here. Of course, your book is called "Me, the Mob, and the Music," a fascinating title, and then uh, one hell of a ride with uh, Tommy James and the Shondells. And and as Rick said, we uh, got the book uh, and, and couldn't put it down. It, it's a fantastic read. As you said, Tommy, you started out uh, actually born in Dayton, but to moved around a little bit. I know your father was in the, the hotel business area. We right. Spent some time in Wisconsin. Then you settled in Niles. Now, those were your, your formative years. And what I was impressed with is you often hear about the, you know, the, the star that has the, oh, the childhood where maybe the, the father's an alcoholic and the mother beats him. It sounded like you actually had mother and father wise. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> they were pretty straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably missed out on a lot, too. <laughs> What was it like well, gro- growing up in Niles, uh, Tom? Well, I, I loved it, and I, you know, uh, it was so great because Niles is just sort of the perfect size town. I love growing up in the Midwest. I really, uh, really feel that uh, it's a very healthy place to grow up for, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually. It's just a great place. So, you know, I, I started my first band, basically, when <clears throat> in seventh grade in Niles Junior High School. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, that's the group uh, it was they, we were called the Tornadoes, and we played everybody's music. Uh, all, you know, cover, we were a cover band all through junior high and high school. When I was a junior, uh, we actually had a couple of little label deals. I got a job after school at the Spinner Record Shop in Niles and uh, learned the trade papers and got a really a, a great education. I couldn't have got any other way in the music business. So uh, before I was out of high school, I had two little regional label deals. And the second one, when I was a junior in high school, was where Hanky Panky came from. And, uh, our first hit. It certainly was that. It, and that was at a time, you know, you're talking about when you're in junior high school and you you have a band. I mean, that was the era when just about every kid got together four guys and they yeah. had a garage band someplace, didn't they? That's right. Well, being a being a rock and roller was a job opportunity back then. Truthfully, it was uh, it was a great time to uh, for, for music and for, uh, you know, everybody had cheap guitars and amps and uh, uh, you could get together in somebody's garage and actually make some money. That's what we did. Uh, you know, we played sock hops and, and uh, American Legion halls and Elks clubs and all that stuff. And when uh, we recorded Hanky Panky, we actually changed our name to the Shondells back in 63. The record came out on a little label called Snap Records in Michigan. And we, we, could, we couldn't really break out of Michigan, so the record kind of came and went. So the following year, I graduated from Niles Senior High School and in 65 took my band on the road, played up through the Midwest. And while I was in Rockford, Illinois, uh, in early 66, the club we were working got shot shut down by the IRS in the middle of our two weeks <laughs> and uh, went belly up. So uh, we went back to Niles feeling very dejected and very uh, depressed. But that's how the good Lord works, because as soon as I got back to Niles, we got a call from Pittsburgh that Hanky Panky, this record we had recorded two years earlier, was sitting at number one and had been bootlegged. They sold 80,000 copies of them, sold them in 10 days, and we were sitting at number one. And they tracked me down. And if I hadn't have been home, 
if that club hadn't yeah. gone broke in the middle of my two yeah. weeks, you you and I wouldn't be talking here. <laughs> From the time your your uh, album or your song, your single there, Hanky Panky, went number one in Pittsburgh, you were like the biggest thing in Pittsburgh. Now your band, the original band that you recorded that with, it was no more, right? It broke up. Yeah, pretty I much. Could, we couldn't put them back together. A couple of members had moved away, and so I had to go to Pittsburgh by myself uh, with the record producer Jack Douglas, who by the way was a DJ in Niles hmm. at WNIL where we recorded the record and um so we went to pittsburgh and uh um you know i did interviews and television and sure enough we were outside the city limits i'm nobody i go to (laughs) pittsburgh i'm a rock star you know so uh uh, basically what happened is i grabbed the first bar band i could find and they became sort of the new shondells and two weeks later we were in new york and selling the master and uh uh, I don't want to get too long-winded with it, but um, this was the reason for the provocative title of the book. We uh, got a yes from everybody, Columbia, Epic, mm-hmm. RCA, Atlantic, and we're really flying high. And the next morning, we start getting calls back from the record companies saying, listen, we got a pass. <laughs> wow. I said, what do you mean you got a pass? And, you know, the last place we had taken the record to, by the way, was Roulette Records. Uh-huh. Finally, Jerry Wexler at Atlantic leveled with us and told us that Morris Levy from Roulette Records, the head of Roulette Records, had called all the other record companies and said, this is my record, back <laughs> off. <laughs> and they did. And we were apparently going to be on Roulette Records. That is actually how we ended up on Roulette. And that's the fascinating thing about reading your book is that you make it sound as though Morris Levy sounded in person exactly the way he comes across in the book. Well, he did. He was right out of central casting, this guy, you know. Uh, When we finally met him, I mean, he was uh, was a gangster. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, of course, what none of the fans, virtually none of the fans knew, and we certainly didn't know, uh, was that Roulette Records, in addition to being a a record label, was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. Wow. And this made life real interesting. We, uh, when we met Morris, uh, you know, he was about 250, uh, six foot four, a very scary and intimidating guy who who talked like this <laughs> and uh, you know played the role great and he was right out of the movies the people we were up there with were too wow. and uh, so this was a the beginning of a very tumultuous relationship and that in essence is what the book is about it's an autobiography with about two-thirds of it devoted to this very dangerous relationship up at roulette and it really was there were, we were we were very lucky to make it out of there in one piece of course record companies have always been infamous for dishonest bookkeeping and never adequately rewarding songwriters and artists for their creativity and hard work it was that way in the extreme for you and those you yeah. worked with wasn't it well that's true this was uh, that taken, uh, you know, to a, to the nth degree. Roulette, you know, the funny part about it, if we had gone with one of those corporate labels that, uh, like Columbia or RCA, we probably would have been handed to a producer. We would have got lost in the numbers, and mm-hmm. with a record like Hanky Panky, that's probably the last time anybody would have heard from us, you know, it mm-hmm. was... We'd have been a one-hit wonder. At Roulette, they genuinely needed us, though. So that was the other side of the coin, was that, you know, at Roulette, we got treated like royalty at a creative level. It's just that getting your money was like taking a bone from a Doberman. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Before the thing was over, they were into us for about 30 to $40 million, and that's just money we weren't going to see. But by the same token, if it hadn't have been for Morris Levy, there wouldn't have been a Tommy James. So, you know, I had to weigh these two realities. The other thing was that this was, you know, the people we were rubbing shoulders with were very dangerous people. I mean, uh, we would meet somebody in Morris's office, and a week later we'd see him on the TV news being hauled out of a, a warehouse in New Jersey in handcuffs, you know. And right. say, Isn't that the guy we just met up at Morris's <laughs> office? And, yeah, it was. Well, this sort of thing kept happening. You know, the people w- the, that we'd see up there suddenly had names when you listen to the news. Sure, sure. So that was uh, how it went up there. And so I chronicle all that in the book. And we try to, you know, virtually nobody knew that while we were, you know, putting out Money Money and Crimson and Clover, there was this very sinister story going on behind us. I have no doubt that anyone who reads your book will be incredibly fascinated about these associations 
and how that content weaves throughout the story and just how frightening it was. You know, I didn't know how this thing was going to play out. We were truly lucky to get out of there, uh, you know, as I said, in one piece. To complicate matters, as if this needed any more complication, back in Niles, Michigan, uh, your girlfriend at the time, uh, you wanted yes. a father and a child with her, and, and she's yep. staying back at Nile with the, uh, Niles with the, your, your infant son. So you're off in New York, they're back in Niles, and obviously that wasn't the best of situations. No, no, and I... I, you know, there's there's a lot of things that happened personally that uh, a lot of things I wasn't very proud of, and a lot of things I wish I could have done different. But it's amazing when you are when you do, you know, you think you're ready for something like this because mm-hmm. I had been in groups for a long time, but you never are. Don't get me wrong, I I I thank the good Lord every day for being blessed with uh, the kind of longevity we had. This is a this is a business that maybe gives you two three years, and we've been doing it for over forty, but. Mm-hmm. It also takes, uh, you know, in order to do one thing, you can't do another. I mean, it's what, you know, you, so you, if you devote your life to, you know, self-promotion and that sort of things, you definitely give up things on the other side, a family life, uh, all that sort of thing. And that that's just the reality of the situation, unfortunately. While there might have been some things personally that you would have changed at the start of your career and possibly throughout, it's also important to remember just how young you were, even at the pinnacle, you were still 19. 18, 20 years old, and you know, you were first in a group picking up a guitar at 11 and 12, so it's important for people to remember that, too. Well, that's true, and I, you know, I'm always amazed that I wasn't sent to my room. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to tell you the truth, uh, I look at how young I was back then, and my folks were very supportive, God mm-hmm. bless them, they really always, I was an only child, and they really tried to always give me the best of, of everything, and they did, and I, I was very indulged and very spoiled, but... Uh, Honestly, uh, I never wanted to do anything other than play rock and roll. It's just, you know, it's just one of those things I felt was my task in life. I, it's not like I had anything. You know, it's not like I could be a garbage man or anything. <laughs> this thing didn't work out. You know? It wasn't like I was going to be a dentist. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I'm I'm sure glad it did. And I and I truly and I mean this sincerely. I say this in the book. I don't know why the good Lord blessed me through these crazy people. But he did. And you came up at the right time, Tommy. I mean, you know, you're, you're a baby boom kid. Uh, you know, as we talked about, everybody had a garage band. Uh, you know, you, you hit it big in, in 66. You've been going at it now over over 40 years. But, you know, you, you think about the, you know, I think anybody in, in our generation, we look at kind of seminal times and certainly the Kennedy assassinations. And as far as pop music right. or whatever, it's the Ed Sullivan show and, and watching the Beatles on there. And I know that that certainly uh, resonated with, with you as well. Oh, but, yeah. I mean, all this stuff that you're talking about are things that basically I lived through. Uh, uh, so there's this, this this historical sense to so much of this stuff. Uh, the presidential campaign of '68 with Hubert Humphrey, the uh, just the whole the whole vibe of of traveling through all this and doing music at the same time. Because rock and roll, the funny part is. Rock and roll really, you know, we, we say this so much, but rock and roll really was the soundtrack to our lives. It really was, you're right. And, you're right. And, and as you, you know, I can almost, you know, hear any song and sort of place a moment in time to that because they all sort of go together for me. Back in the day when we were kids, you know, it was AM radio, top forty radio, and you would hear yeah. Fra- you would hear Frank Sinatra, then you would hear the Beatles and Tommy James, and and there, there wasn't all this uh, consultants getting involved and in, and formatting radio. I mean, it was really it that's was really the golden true. age. And that's very true. And what was, you know, the whole thing about it was that you had sixty million baby boom kids mm-hmm. unleashed on the society with money in their pockets that were financing all this. One of the things, for example, that I dearly miss, because I'm talking about, you know, one minute I'll be talking about Vinny the Chin Gigante, and the next minute I'm talking about Woodstock, and the next right. minute I'm talking about uh, radio. And, you know, because we were a creature of radio. We were invented by radio. Mm-hmm. I owe radio my whole existence. My, um, I, I, And I mean that. Uh, I... When I think of what the condition of radio was in the 1960s, for example, you had these, oh, probably three dozen monolithic top 40, 50,000 watt AM stations, with each station servicing two to 10 million people, depending on the market. Mm. And you had this network of these gargantuan stations across the United States, all playing the same music. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that was incredible. It was. You know, the average top 20 record back then got 100 times the airplay that a number one record does today. From AM radio, FM comes in. The songs go from a minute 50 to two minutes to all of a sudden four minutes. You're a part right. of that with the Crimson and Clover. I mean, obviously. And the album have, market. Yeah, and you have to adapt to that as well. That's right. We, One of the things, for example, we talk about, uh, we get involved in the music a little bit, Crimson and Clover was such a momentous moment for us when that record came out because so much was going on, not only in the country, but in my life. We had just come off the Hubert Humphrey presidential campaign. And, you know, he ended up doing the liner notes for the Crimson and Clover album. Mm. For example, you know, this is this is a weird combination of politics and music. First of all, it was the first time that a rock group and a political candidate teamed up. Never happened before. When we left on that campaign in August, after the convention, when all the kids got beat up, you know, yeah. and we're going, yeah. my God, what have we got ourselves into? Is every rally going to be like this? And before it was done, he asked me to be president's advisor on youth affairs. He was very concerned about the youth vote and so forth and thought that Washington was losing touch with the, the younger people. And, that, uh, and he told us how he was going to end the Vietnam War. It was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we were really privy to a lot of interesting stuff stuff at the same time when we left in august on that campaign the hot acts of the day were you know us the rascals the buckinghams the association gary puckett all singles acts right Mm -hmm. when we come back 90 days later it's all album acts it's led zeppelin blood sweat and tears joe cocker Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I mean, just unbelievable how the record business turned upside down in 90 days. And we knew if we were going to continue that we had to suddenly sell albums, which is something we had never done at Roulette. It was all singles. Mm -hmm. And we were so fortunate that we were working on Crimson and Clover at that moment because Crimson and Clover, the single, allowed us to make that move, that pivot from AM top 40 singles to FM album-oriented progressive rock. And there's no way any other record we ever worked on would have done that. So Crimson and Clover was the right song at the right moment so that our careers could continue. We're talking with Tommy James, and we're talking about his book, Me, the Mob, and the Music, One Hell of a Ride, of course, with Tommy James and the Shondells. And, and Tommy, one of the things that you put so well in the book and your relationship at Roulette uh, Records is you would come in with your latest hit, and uh, next thing you know, Morris uh, Levy was saying, okay, that's nice, what's next? I mean, it was like you never had a chance to, <laughs> to right. really, to really enjoy it. I couldn't breathe, yeah. you're right. Yeah, that, what was that like? Well, it was very tough. You know, on one hand, though, uh, as, as hard as it was if we hadn't been pushed like that we wouldn't have had that many hits mm, mm-hmm. and so i you know one of the things about my relationship with mars is how schizophrenic it is it's a real love hate relationship because on there's always this qualification there's always a comma right. by right. everything i say every time I go to say something nasty, I remember, but by the same token, <laughs> we wouldn't have had this hit if it wasn't for Morris pushing us like he did. Now, I mean, he, he had his own reasons, obviously, right. that weren't necessarily ours, but the truth is, if we had been anywhere else, we wouldn't have been nearly as successful. Of course, uh, drugs a big po- uh, part of the culture in the 1960s, and I saw an interview with, with Paul McCartney uh, several years ago where you know he always hesitates about the, their influence on drugs on the Beatles because he says it kind of tends to glamorize it, but he said, really, it was a it was an innocent thing. It was naive. I mean, we were just trying something. It, is that kind of how you found it? I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't well, yeah, I mean, but I, you know, I must say... Uh, we were, you know, the whole group was popping pills. Uh And, you know, basically we were staying up all night writing. We were in the studio all night and we used, you know, the ability to stay up the amphetamines as, uh, you know, mostly to work, believe it or not. I I don't recommend that to anybody because you'll be a neurotic nutcase in about, six months but the point was we were we got involved in a lot of really nasty stuff from staying up nights and having to work all night and stuff like that we were trying everything but thank god that was uh that ended you know i really did you got to say in the long run too i i ended up way ahead i'm just you know i've been very uncomfortable telling this story Mm. i've been wanting to tell this story for a very long time and nobody knew this right 
and uh, I started, we, Martin Fitzpatrick and I started writing this autobiography about eight years ago. And, um, you know, we just, every time we'd come to the mob thing, we just stopped to say, we can't write this, but if we don't tell the roulette story, none of this is going to make sense. So we just put the book on a shelf for a couple of years until December of 05, the last of uh, the, uh, I call them the roulette regulars, uh, passes away, and I felt that we could uh, finish the book. The good news is, eventually, you did get paid. Your payday did come, all of the yes. the back. Uh, and, and, you know, I was telling Rick before we went on here, I said, you know, reading the book, okay, you had to fight for your money, but you got your money, you know, when you were old enough to, I think, appreciate it. You got. Your- I would have probably killed myself That's- with it if I had had all that money in my pocket at that moment. So it was a blessing in, in, in a way. It was. Yeah. It really was. And I, I tell you, you know, good Lord's looked out for me for a whole lot of years, and he still is. I Look, I'm getting to tell this story. The funny part is, <laughs> telling this story is going to be probably the most exciting and, and most, uh, uh, I guess, successful thing that I could do. It's going to be the biggest thing I've ever been involved in. It's going to be a movie in another 18 months. Wow. And then it's going to be a Broadway show. It's going to make a, a great one. I mean, just like I mm-hmm. said, the, the book is is very riveting, and it certainly does. So, so you got both aspects going: the movie and the Broadway show. Yeah, the show. movie is going to be uh, produced by Barry Rosen and Mary Gleason for uh, Triangle Pictures. It's going to be a real all star cast. We're going to make a big announcement in three or four weeks about directors and so forth, and then um, uh, it's going to be a Broadway play. It's going to be first in L.A. in about nine months, then Chicago, and then Broadway. And we're just absolutely, I'm, I'm just absolutely in awe over this because I can't believe this has all happened so fast. That You know, the public's reaction to... Uh, yeah. To the book and so forth, it's just been amazing. I thought, too, that the end of the book was very touching. You talked about your complicated relationship with, with Morris. I mean, he was your protector, but he also could have very much been your killer at different times. Absolutely. And he winds up dying. He winds up uh, getting cancer and, and, a, and a death, and, and it was one of those things that you kind of put off seeing him again, and finally, like we've all done at different times, you put it off too long, and, and he goes. And I thought that that was a very um, poignant ending to the book where you're, you know, you're kind of rehashing that a little bit. and, and yeah. Uh, they had to be mixed emotions, obviously. Oh, definitely. I had real mixed feelings about all that. First of all, Morris had been sentenced to prison. He had, was indicted and convicted in 88 of uh, racketeering. He was headed for jail, got cancer, and died before he served a day. So that was, and he then died one day before I got back. I was going to go see him, and he died the night before I could talk to him. So the last scene of the movie, by the way, and the book is I sort of have this imaginary conversation with him, the one I, I guess I would have had. So that was uh, that's kind of how the story ends. The book, the funny part is Morris is the star of the show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's the Morris Levy show. with, uh, yeah, with uh, Morris is really the most interesting character <laughs> in the book and uh you know so and he really was yeah exactly hey tanya will you have a role in helping to cast people because oh, obviously yeah. you knew them intimately yes i'm gonna there's gonna be i'm gonna have to uh talk about who this guy looked like and what this guy sounded oh. like and all that stuff there's i'm gonna be obviously a, a technical advisor and i'm also gonna i'll probably play a bit part in the movie i'll be a bartender so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a jam maybe i'll be a dj yeah. sure you'll be like alfred hitchcock just having a little yeah. role see if, yeah. see if anybody right. can find tommy james in the background yeah. that's right well, i'm reading the book to, to my wife uh, before we go to bed usually a lot of times and she said at the question that she asked me at the end of the book was hey what happened to brian your little boy you talked about oh your- we're very close good good he's a he, he became a very he's a very talented kid you know the thing is he's a hell of a drummer ah. but mm-hmm. i did not uh encourage him to do that uh, uh he uh, is also a great design engineer and that's really wow. what he's doing for a living and we're all one big happy family thankfully again when were you able to really reconnect with him again and, and, and obviously bring him back into the family again? Well, you know, I, it never really was. Uh, the funny part is in the, the one thing that I regret about the book is that I never told that story mm. about Brian and, and me. And Brian and Diane sort of disappear in one part of the book. And I never 
mm. resolve that, and I should have done that. It was one part of the book that just kind of didn't get written. So I try to talk about it in, when I do interviews about what happened, is that but Brian basically and I always stayed in touch, and yeah. it wasn't like we were ever estranged or anything. And so Brian is, you know, Brian is, is 45 years old today. <laughs> he'll be, at the end of the month, actually, on the 22nd, wow. he'll be 45. Your life now, obviously, is, is still making music, I understand. Oh, sure. We're all over the country performing. Anybody wants to come to our website, it's just TommyJames.com. And we have new product. We have our own label and new product coming out all the time. How, how do you break into the uh, the music business again, Tommy? I mean, uh, we talked about it before. I mean, there was, you know, once you uh, have been in it for 40 years or something, all of a sudden you kind of, with the way radio is now, you kind of, people get pushed aside a little bit. How do you, do you, do you use the internet as a tool then to kind of uh, reinvent yourself a little well, bit? Well, you know, we, I basically, the, the music has never not been in front of the public. Hmm. Honestly, uh, uh, you know, it, you know, we're obviously not on the the top forty stations today, but right. we certainly are on all the classic rock. And You're on our station, and, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and you know, it's like we're and a lot of AC. You know, we in '06 we had a hold the hold the fire album and three no, three top five records, uh, adult contemporary. One of them went number one, Love Words. Uh, exactly 40 years to the week after Hanky Panky, actually. Wow, that's phenomenal. You know, six. And um, I'm back in the studio now with the original Shondells from Pittsburgh, the, the group from Pittsburgh. We just finished uh, a couple of songs for the movie. And one of them is going to be closing credits to the movie. Is going to be uh, this brand new version of I Think We're Alone Now that's mm. slow and dreamy. And the the whole... It's it's totally opposite from the original record, and uh, the last scene of the movie, of course, uh, Morris Levy uh, passes, and I have this imaginary conversation with him, and right at the end, then it, it fades into "I think we're alone now." Yeah. So, in other words, the meaning of the song, you know, Morris has died, and we're alone now, rather than right. "Young Love," which the original <laughs> record was about. So, even the meaning of "I think we're alone now" changed. One of the things I found about your book that was very encouraging and certainly very touching at the same time was that you've always spoken very fondly of those original friends who made up your original groups, obviously oh, yeah. stayed in touch. And Well, we and, have. Yeah, no, I actually heard from Mike Booth, the first drummer, my first, you know, the, the first musician that, uh, uh, you know, I talked about in the book actually is, uh, is a, I heard from him the other night, as a matter of fact. It was great to hear from him. And you're still putting on great shows. I know I had a buddy that saw you in Cleveland a few years ago and says that the energy is is still there. And what's got to be neat, i got to think, Tommy, is obviously you have the, the, the fans that knew you from day one that follow you around, but also you're probably picking up uh, new generations of fans. I know that's what, what... You know, it's so amazing. We have I, I look out in the concert crowd now, we have three generations yeah. of fans out there. And it really is amazing. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of colleges now and things. <laughs> You know, if anybody, by the way, wants to check out our dates or come to a show, just come to the website. They're all posted. We're going to be at the Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the 14th and the 15th, by the way. Fantastic. Doing a seminar on the book on the 14th and then the 15th, we're doing a concert there. So uh, really, it's uh, it's an amazing time right now, and I'm having a ball. Well, great. Well, Tommy, thanks for taking some time to, to chat with us. The book is called Me, the Mob, and, and the Music, and it's been great to kind of walking down memory lane. You've certainly been uh, one of uh, our heroes over the years, and it's good well, to see you. Well, thank you so much. It's great to talk with you guys. Thanks a lot, Tommy. Thank you, Tommy. Bye -bye. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. 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 Bye -bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye -